Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore the psychology of psychedelic experience. With me is Professor Stanley Krippner, who is the Alan Watts Professor of Psychology at Saybrook University. Dr. Krippner is the author of numerous books in psychology, past president of numerous psychological organizations, the recipient of the Lifetime Career Award from the Parapsychological Association, and I'll bet several others as well. Amongst his many volumes of work is an anthology published by the American Psychological Association called Varieties of anomalous experience. Welcome, Stan. Thank you. You know, I think, uh, speaking of psychedelics, uh, it's interesting that you are the Alan Watts professor at uh, Saybrook University. I think Alan was well known for uh, engaging in a variety of uh, altered states of consciousness. Yes, he certainly was. And one of my former students at Saybrook University has recently co-edited the book about Alan Watts called Alan Watts Here and Now. Marvelous book, and he asked me to write the chapter on Alan Watts' experiences with the psychedelics, which I was happy to do. And Alan wrote a book, The Joyous Cosmology, which I think is the best phenomenological description of a psychedelic experience. Now, I met Alan in a very unusual way. I was at the American Psychological Association, and I went to a panel, the room was absolutely full to overflowing, where Timothy Leary was talking about his recent experiments with psilocybin. Mm -hmm. And um, on that same panel was uh, Gerald Hurd, a noted author who had <coughs> experimented with psychedelics. And uh, Alan Watts wasn't there, but many other people were. And so I quickly wrote Tim a letter saying I'd like to volunteer for the experiment. And I had a friend at, 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 uh, at Harvard, um, mm -hmm. Stephen Kleinberg, who went on to become a very distinguished social psychologist, and he took the psilocybin experiment, and so I said, put in a good word for me. He did, and so I got invited. Mm -hmm. And so I left Kent State University for a weekend and got to Harvard and linked up with Steve, went in for my interview with Tim, and he said, you're just the type of person who I want to have this experience, and we're uh, drawing the experiment to a close. Yours will be one of the last legal times we will have to take it. Uh, so I went to a dinner party that Tim was having for Alan Watts. <coughs> Tim took a liking to me, thank mm -hmm. heavens, and he let me drive in his car to this dinner party for Alan Watts. That's how I met Alan Watts, mm. and it was a potluck dinner. I ate something that didn't agree to me. I got back to Steve's apartment. I was throwing up all night. Oh. The next day was my interview with the facilitators, and I said, Steve, I'm not going to miss this experience. I want you to get me there half an hour. I can't even walk on my own. You put me down in the chair, and I'll be there when... Uh, Alan and mm -hmm. Sarah come in, not Alan Watts, Alan Cohen. And so they came in, they interviewed me, they went through the procedure, I smiled, they said goodbye, I ran to the washroom, Steve came and took me back to his apartment where I was sick for the rest of the afternoon. He took me to the apartment of Sarah where the experiment was going to take place. Tim came in, gave us the psilocybin, and then he left to consult with the local chief of police about the legality of all of this. As soon as the psilocybin hit, all of my symptoms disappeared. I was fine for the rest of the night. I had a great mm -hmm. experience. I wrote it up. It's appeared in several anthologies. At the peak of the experience, 
I was in an ocean and it was very, very turbulent. I was in a little boat rocking back and forth. I thought, look, this is life. This is life. We're all hanging on to this little raft, this little boat, not knowing when it will capsize. And then there was God coming out of the ocean. God in a, shall we say, Eastern Indian garb and the menorah and likeness and he had a look of compassion on his face, or it might have been a sheet, it was a very androgynous mm -hmm. figure. And then I knew, yes, God cannot do anything about it. It's up to us to sail our boat. He gives us compassion. That's all that we can expect from God. It's up to us from that point. So you on. had quite an epiphany. Yes, that was quite an epiphany. So I wrote that up, and that was the end of my experiences for a while. And then, of course, the rest is history. Tim went off on his own. His associate, Richard Alpert, went off on his own, became Baba Ramdas. Ralph Metzger went on off on his own, became a very noted psychologist. He's celebrating his 80th birthday this year, and I'm going to be going to his party, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. All three of us have remained friends, despite the fact that I was very unhappy with Tim for his doctrine of uh, tune in and drop out and um, other things that he did, giving LSD fairly indiscriminately to people. But despite that fact, um, we remained friends up to the end. I saw him mm -hmm. shortly before his death after he got out of prison. He got out of prison and he knew everything I'd been doing. I said, Tim, how, how did you have a time to check up on? He said, when you're in prison, you do a lot of reading. Mm. and. Him going to prison was another story. He never should have gone to prison. They caught his car going from Mexico to the United States with marijuana in his possession. Mm -hmm. It wasn't his marijuana. His son had brought some marijuana against Tim's advice, and he gave it to his sister who put it in her bra, and Tim was shocked. And so when he was arrested, when they found the marijuana in Susan's bra, Tim took responsibility to save his kids. Mm. So all of that was trumped up. Yeah. And, um, but there was enormous controversy surrounding uh, that era, and, and particularly surrounding Timothy Leary. That's right. Look, Tim did some outrageous things, but the government is even more outrageous in doing some things which underline the legitimate research. Mm -hmm. However, back to my own story, back in about 1957, I read a Life magazine article about a shaman in Mexico who was using the sacred mushrooms. Mm -hmm. They used a false name, but her name was Maria Sabina. And I thought, I would like to take those mushrooms someday, not realizing that in 1970, a psychiatrist friend of mine, Salvador Roquette, invited me to join him on a trip to Huatl de Jimenez in Oaxaca, Mexico, to meet Maria Sabina, who is now a legendary shaman in her early 90s, mm -hmm. or late 80s at the time, one never knows, about, about shamans who didn't have a birth certificate. We took probably the last good photographs of Maria Sabina before her death, and we had a wonderful interview with her, and she said that she was too old to take the mushrooms because they do exert something upon the system. Yeah. And so she turned us over to one of her apprentices who gave us a wonderful velada that night. And she said, I don't have quite enough mushrooms to go along. A velada? A velada, V-E-L-A-D-A, -A, a nighttime mushroom ceremony. Okay. Singing, chanting, the whole ball of wax, beautiful. Mm -hmm. I learned more being her assistant than I did if I had taken the mushrooms myself. She sent me to help out the people in distress because she couldn't speak English. And there was a former Miss Kentucky, a former concert pianist in distress, and he was Mexican, she was American. And I went over, she had lived her life dependent upon her beauty that had faded. Mm. So now she had to find inner resources. So I helped her find the inner resources when she was inebriated by the mushrooms. The concert pianist had stage fright. I helped him get over the stage. Again, I didn't do this. The mushrooms did this, yeah. but I facilitated mm -hmm. this. 
He is now a famous concert pianist again. She went on to live a very happy life. Now, they were so happy that they kissed me, one on each cheek. The problem is they've both been vomiting the mushroom <laughs> Judas to somebody. I could hardly breathe with oh. the vomit coming from both of them as they were kissing me in their gratitude. So I've had a number of experiences both with shamans in Latin America as well as with um, legal experiences, most notably with the ayahuasca churches both in Hawaii and in Brazil. Mm -hmm. I suppose my main contribution to the academic side is the work that I have done with creativity in psychedelics. In fact, I've just written an article on creativity in psychedelics for a special issue of the Journal of Humanistic mm -hmm. Psychology, and your listeners might watch for that. It'll yeah. be out in maybe six or seven months. So I've interviewed over 100 artists and musicians who felt that their psychedelic experience with mushrooms, LSD, peyote, mescaline, psilocybin, ayahuasca, marijuana, hashish, had positively impacted their work. Okay. You don't take LSD and immediately become an artist. It's one of many experiences that you have which in some way feeds into your creativity. Mm -hmm. So I have to make that clear. Other artists will take a psychedelic it'll have virtually no effect except it reinforces what they're already doing. Mm -hmm. And there have been some experiments with psychedelics and creativity. And at best, they will make modest positive scores on creativity tests. And also the phenomenology indicates that the content of their work and sometimes the style of their work has been altered due to the psychedelics. Alex and Allison Gray are two friends of mine. They're the most current artists who are associated with psychedelics. Mm -hmm. But w one of the things I recall from your writings about, about this is that, uh, in particular, musicians who perform while under the influence of these drugs, uh, it really, in your experience, did not improve their performance, even if they thought it did. It didn't improve their performance but they often got ideas for new types of music and new types of lyrics. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. Most of the musicians I interviewed would not perform under the influence of the drugs because they found out all too soon that it did not enhance, and in most cases detracted from their performance. Absolutely. But with I, visual artists, that might be different. It's a whole different experience. It of doesn't course it is. depend on precise timing, for precise example. Precise timing, right. And under psychedelics, your time is wandering all over the place, mm -hmm. right. I interviewed Bob Weir, a member of the Grateful Dead, at a party in California. Last time I saw Susan Leary alive, and I could see she was going downhill. The poor girl eventually killed herself. Yes. And I spent time with her, and she was so far distant than the beautiful young woman I met at Timothy Leary's short-lived marriage to a Swedish model, where she was there in high heels and a low-cut gown at the age of 14, 15, hmm. and uh, flirting with me and several of the other men, very buoyant, very cheerful. Uh, sad story, but nevertheless, um, my contact with Bob Weir who I included in my first article about psychedelic art and music, mm -hmm. happened to be the first academic publication where the Grateful Dead was mentioned. Mm -hmm. Later, I did a whole dream telepathy experiment with the Grateful Dead. Now, you go to the mm -hmm. University of California, which has a Grateful Dead archive, and I'm hailed as the godfather of serious academic interest in the Grateful Dead, and they have copies of those articles in the museum case. Well, you have had a long-standing association with them for many decades. Oh, yes. It was Mickey Hart of the Grateful Dead who introduced me to Rolling Thunder, the shaman I worked with for many years. It was Mickey Hart who introduced me to the other members of the Grateful Dead. I've had many very, very <clears throat> rich experiences of the Grateful Dead. Extremely creative group. I'm given a little footnote or a few lines in some of the biographies of the Grateful Dead. Mm -hmm. Jerry Garcia I was especially fond of, just a very, very brilliant musician and a very, very original creative person. And I have uh, 
never tripped with the Grateful Dead, never had psychedelics with the Grateful Dead. I've had a little marijuana with them over the years backstage, but an exceptional group of people, otherwise they wouldn't have an archive devoted to their creativity at a state university. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk briefly about the dream telepathy experience, because as I understand it, you had a whole concert of people attending a Grateful Dead concert, many of them in various altered states of consciousness from psychedelics and who knows what else, mm -hmm. and they were attempting to send, to project a mental image to a person who was asleep in the dream laboratory that you ran. Well, actually, this experiment has been written up more often than any of my other dream experiments, despite the fact that it was simply a pilot study, yeah. because there are only six nights, and to get solid statistics, you need eight nights. Mm -hmm. Jerry Garcia had the idea. He said, Stan, we're going to have six nights at Port Chester, New York. Maybe we can do a dream telepathy experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I designed something with Montague Allman and Charles Anderton's help, and so every night of the performance, um, my assistant, high school volunteer, Ronnie Mastrom, would flip a coin, heads he would take one slide, tails he would take another slide, and he would put the head slide in an overhead projector. Along with several other slides, suddenly the audience was confronted with a sign during this light, light show. You are about to participate in the ESP experiment. Malcolm Bessett is at the Dream Laboratory in Brooklyn, New York. You are going to see a picture. Use your, your ESP to send this picture to Malcolm Bessett. And then the randomly selected slide would show on the screen. And we monitored his dreams that night. We had a control subject at home who didn't know about the picture either. And the people didn't know about her. She got simply chance results. Mm -hmm. Malcolm Bessett did get shall we say, marginally significant results. Mm -hmm. One night, the picture by a Syrian artist, Grillian, the seven spinal chakras, was flashed on the screen. Person in a yoga position with the seven chakras all illuminated. Oh, yes, yes. Malcolm Besant had one dream about a man with an energy box, another dream about Eastern wisdom, another dream about the spinal cord. How much better correspondence would you like? And you're right, the people in the audience were tripping on LSD, marijuana, heaven only knows what else, and mm -hmm. so they just took this in stride that they would mm -hmm. send this picture. Mm -hmm. And then while they were sending the picture, uh, the Grateful Dead paused in their music and talked a little bit about the picture and gave their reactions to the picture. And so uh, that's part of the dream telepathy history, it's part of the Grateful Dead history, it's part of the Altered States history. Much to my surprise, it's really taken off and has a life of its own. Well, there's an enormous lore associating psychedelic drugs with mystical and psychic experiences. And, uh, and by psychic, I mean measurable parapsychological experiences. Yes. Uh, of course, we know how difficult it is to do those measurements. Uh, what, is, what is your opinion or conclusion about that? Well, your listeners can read the articles by David Luke on this topic. He's mm -hmm. written a whole review, and you're right. An experiment has to be so rigid that the free-flowing psychedelic experience doesn't naturally meld into what's demanded of a parapsychological test. There have been some hits, some marginally interesting results over the years, some very striking results from the studies done by Gene Houston and Robert Masters, by the way. Mm -hmm. But maybe that is something for future uh, researchers to figure out. Mm -hmm. I think that the experiences ayahuasca follow the same suit. Ayahuasca, for your listeners who don't know about it, is a tea from South America. Two jungle plants mixed together which produce a very profound LSD type experience, even though the chemicals are different yes. than LSD. And I've been with these groups uh, ten times. I learned something new each time. Mm -hmm. But my most interesting psychic experience was with my friend Chris Ryan, and we were driving through the rainforest in southern Brazil to a Uniao de Vegetal church. This is one of two legal groups in the United States and Brazil, the other being Santo Daime, and Chris said, 
Did you see that beautiful woman? And I said, what beautiful woman? Oh, she was wearing a green sari, a caste mark on her head, red-headed hair, obvious, not Indian, but Brazilian. I hope she comes to the event tonight. We get to the little sanctuary, and there in the kitchen is a beautiful woman, caste mark, red-headed hair, a green mark, and Chris says, how did you get her so quickly? What do you mean so quickly? I've been here all afternoon. So that's the most notable <laughs> precognitive experience mm -hmm. that he wasn't even on LSD yet. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, some years ago I interviewed uh, a scholar I'm sure you're very familiar with, Houston Smith, deeply involved in psychedelic research, and he did a study comparing the mystical experiences of the great saints and mystics throughout history with the accounts of uh, people under uh, the influence of psychedelic drugs. Mm -hmm. And he determined that there was no difference. That you couldn't, in terms of the experience mm -hmm. itself, the, the mystics and the psychedelics experiences were literally identical. But the difference, he said, wasn't in the experience per se, it was in how it was integrated into the whole life. Of, of the person. The great mystics took those experiences and it changed their lives. They built a whole life around it. And that's not always the case with people who use uh, recreational drugs. No, I agree with Houston right down the line. Um, I've read all of the literature and I think a person can have a valid mystical experience, however you want to define that, but a feeling of mm -hmm. oneness, a feeling of love for humanity, a uh, feeling of union with God, etc. Yes, through psychedelics. This is a minority of people who use psychedelics, by the way, and there's no assurance that the psychedelics will give you a mystical experience. But more important is what they do with that experience. And if they integrate that into their life, then the vision becomes incarnated. If they just use it as gossip or as casual conversation, they haven't learned anything mm -hmm. from it. So the proof of the pitting is pudding is in the tasting of it. Mm -hmm. It's walking your talk. And I think that's the ultimate way that you can evaluate a mystical experience, whether through psychedelics, prayer, yoga, meditation, walks in nature, whatever, what you do with that experience that makes you a better person and what makes the world a better place. Well, you've had a career as a psychologist and a parapsychologist, a teacher and a researcher primarily. Uh, would you say that your career was uh, inspired by your early psychedelic experiences? Oh, good heavens, no. My career was inspired by factors long before I took psychedelics. Mm -hmm. I've had unanimously positive experience of psychedelics, not that I've taken them that often, but I would say that they've reinforced things that I've already known. And they have certainly taught me important lessons. My last ayahuasca experience taught me important lessons that I'm still trying to put into my life. So I entered into these experiences, for better or for worse, as something that I can learn from, as a spiritual guide, not for, shall we say, pleasure hedonistic experiences. Mm -hmm. Like some people do, and I don't put that down, better that they have a hedonistic experience that way than from some of the more dangerous and addictive drugs that could kill them off. Mm -hmm. I should say that I did write a very pioneering article, probably the first scientific phenomenological article on ayahuasca, one of my Saybrook students and I gathered 10 reports of ayahuasca experiences and evaluated them with a scale that one of my other students had developed, the spirituality scale, which takes half a dozen different variables. And we did find a plethora of those variables in the content of their experiences. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is a way of taking the phenomenological experience and subjected it to content analysis. As you can see, whenever I have an unusual experience, the first thought that comes to mind, how can this be applied to research? And secondly, how can this be applied to my life and other people's life? But I'm always on the lookout for new research opportunities because if something is not researched, if it's not a part of the scientific database, it's just anecdotal. That's not good enough for mm -hmm. me. Well, I guess there is a movement now to 
as, as these substances, for example, marijuana, which I think is sort of a, like a psychedelic, yes. as, as they become legalized or decriminalized, there, there's an effort to reintegrate them into various human potential and therapeutic modalities. And I would think that the, the available research, limited as it is, shows that there's some real potential there. Well. In 1972, I wrote an article in which I called for the legalization of marijuana. And I'm not what I would call a marijuana smoker or user, but, and I'm not saying that marijuana use and legalization is not going to have some negative effects, at least for some people. You know, so I'm not, and I would say the same thing for other psychedelics. I consider marijuana minor psychedelic, sure. Mm -hmm. um, Things come with a cost. All th good things come with a cost. So now marijuana is legalized in two states. There will be others along the way. And the good news is that uh, young people have not increased their use of marijuana. Mm -hmm. The bad news is there have been some highway accidents due to marijuana intoxication. People mm -hmm. should never drive under the influence of marijuana. But then on the other hand, how many people have been killed by an overdose of marijuana. People die every day from an overdose of prescription drugs. To my knowledge, nobody has there you are. died there you from are. an overdose of marijuana. So you've got to look yeah. at the whole picture. And people yeah. who are opposed to decriminalization and opposed to legalization are purists. You look at the jails in our country, we jail more a bigger percentage of our population than any country in the world. Half of them are there on drug charges. Many are there for marijuana sale or marijuana use, costing the taxpayers billions of dollars. And once they get out of jail, they can't get jobs, costing the economy billions of dollars. You've got to look at a cost and benefit picture when you come to drug use of any, of any sort. Rather than a legal issue, this should be looked upon as a public health issue. Use of drugs and addiction to drugs, I don't think is immoral. I don't think it's a disease. I think it's a learned behavior. Anything learned can be unlearned. And I think that's the way we should deal with drug addiction. In terms of marijuana, control it, tax it, and if people go over the line, arrest them and throw the books at them. But with psychedelics in general, uh, would you say that the research does or suggests it has potential as a as, as a tool in therapy, in psychotherapy? Well, yes, of course, the research was stopped back in the 1960s, and I saw Masters in Houston's important research being stopped and that of other people. And Salvador Roquette, my friend in Mexico, he was actually arrested and put in jail. Hmm. Many sad stories like that. But the, on the balance, I think that psychedelics can have a psychotherapeutic effect. Also, I think they can add to the enjoyment of life of ordinary people. There's an illegal practice going on right now, especially in California, called microdosing. Oh, yes. Where people, especially in Silicon Valley, the who creative are creative designers. That's right. Yes. yes, they're taking a microdose before they do design work, before they do computer work, mm -hmm. and they claim it's assisting their creativity. The untold story is the role that psychedelics played in the whole development of the computer industry and the whole development of Silicon Valley. And I think that it played a larger role mm -hmm. than most people will acknowledge. Well, Stan, we're out of time. But uh, once again, it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for being with me. You are welcome. And thank you for being with us. <laughs> Thank you.